Let's move on to topic four. We are talking about God of War Ragnarok. Now, as of recording, I have Platinum God of War Ragnarok last night. Yeah, literally <laughs> right down to the buzzer beater. Um, I just want to talk about my impressions of God of War uh, Ragnarok, its story, things that may have changed from 2018 or that they added to the experience. Um, some of you guys know that I started streaming this game when it did launch, and unfortunately just because of things going on, I was not the best at keeping up with that story, and uh, we did not make it through on a stream aspect, but decided to continue playing it off of stream after making it about 13 hours through on there, um, and continued it to completion uh, over the break and as of now. So I wanted to give you my thoughts on that. Uh, obviously, you're going to stay spoiler-free, at least for this beginning section. If at any point you do want to avoid all the spoilers that we're going to go into, because we're probably going to talk, if not everything, definitely the story beats and the things that hit me the hardest um, with this game. I will give you a fair warning when that does come up, and we are going to be diving into full spoilers, so just a fair warning there. So, God of War Ragnarok. Like I mentioned, we streamed... For 13 hours, uh, over on twitch.tv slash enigma911. Hey, go follow. Streamed it there, had a great time, and afterwards uh, have played a total to get platinum 53 hours. Now, first off, definitely got my money's worth. <laughs> um, it's not... If you golden path it, obviously the main story is not going to take you that long. I think I got to the main end of the main story around 40, 42. Um, and there was definitely a lot of side activities that not got distracted by, but kind of took my attention and I focused on those or some experiences that I took a little bit slower and wasn't in such a rush to get to. So if you wanted to complete it in a shorter time, you definitely could. Um, but overall, for the game, I absolutely loved it and adored it. Um, 2018 was such a special game in and itself. Um, had a great story there of obviously Kratos and Atreus and their relationship and taking Kratos' character and modifying it or at least adapting him or showing the growth in his character from what we knew of the original PlayStation 2, PlayStation 3 launches of 1, 2, and 3. I know there was Ascension and maybe one other one on the mobile platforms of like PlayStation Vita or PSP that I never played. But adapting his character and giving him some character growth um, to make him a more relatable character and just kind of make it more of a heartwarming journey and make a character that you wanted to root for instead of just this brute, all outrage monster that was the earlier games while those games are still a lot of fun and very rewarding this made it more in my opinion and i think a lot of people's opinion a more i guess emotional journey or relatable journey um and a character you could connect with compared to kratos of old um, and Ragnarok definitely delivers, I would say, on the conclusion of Kratos' and Atreus' story and along with the characters that we met in the 2018 version and have continued uh, in this journey uh, as we explore Ragnarok and the events transpiring there. Um, gameplay, I will say, feels more of the same, which isn't a bad thing the combat you know that they developed and created for 2018 just flowed very well everybody fell in love with the leviathan axe and the recall mechanic and everything there that it added to it um adding to or adding the blades of chaos back into it felt you know fun and familiar um in what you could do with that weapon and it just is more of the same which once again isn't a bad thing but it's more of a return to form that just feels like an add-on or more more of this experience that we loved and cared about with the initial launch. Um, some things I think that Ragnarok does better than the original 2018 release, 
I think the side characters that they decided to add to this world and share in the experiences and story with, I think their developments in Ragnarok are amazing and way, way better uh, than 2018's version. 2018 very much felt like a kind of a glimpse or at least like just a plain introduction of like this character's here they're gonna help with this while Ragnarok really dove and delve I felt better into each of the characters whether it was Brock and Sindri whether it was Freya and obviously the frayed relationship you had at the end of 2018 with the whole Balder situation um, and then even new characters that they did add with obviously learning about Odin and Thor and them being the main antagonists of this game, learning their stories and their backstories and giving them character development and emotions that you felt along the way of that journey of that story. This one I thought did a lot better job of that. And I think that does <clears throat> kind of tie into the side quests. Um, if you decide to take the time to actually do those, then you are definitely rewarded for your time in terms of story, and I think it adds to the experience overall. Whereas 2018's, they were good, but sometimes felt more just like a task instead of something that was adding to the full overall experience and the main story and plot that they were trying to tell. Um, in terms of difficulty, how did this game compare to 2018? Now, 2018, obviously, being at this point five years ago, there's a little bit of gap in knowledge of my full experience of 2018. Replaying the beginning of 2018, I was getting my ass whooped big time <laughs> leading into Ragnarok. And I'm not sure if that was just being out of practice with the, <clears throat> maybe not the control scheme, but for how things worked in the world and when to dodge, when to block, blah, 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 whatever. I was getting my ass whooped. And this game is i will say more difficult than 2018's um and i think it's not a detriment to the game but this one definitely there were points not struggling i would say but there was a lot of retries in this game now note and this is not meant to be like oh i played it this way i'm better than everyone no for some reason, I decided not to use the resurrection mechanic. So in God of War 2018, you had the ability for Atreus to resurrect you with a health stone if you happen to fall and die once. They brought that back in this game. If you bought it, then you would have the ability. For some reason, I decided not to. So I never had that ability of, oh, I died, second wind, I can go after this boss monster, whatever it is. Don't ask me why. I literally have no reason. It wasn't me trying to feel like I was doing big PP energy and, you know, oh, I can beat this game in one shot or Bloodborne because I suck at those games. <laughs> like I, I, I literally don't know. I don't know why I didn't do it. I don't know why I decided to punish myself with it. <laughs> I just did it. That's how I played it all the way through. Um, but there was a lot of times, especially when it came to the mini bosses, <clears throat> that it just took a lot of attempts. It never felt like enraging, maybe in the moment of like, oh no, I almost killed you, like that kind of thing. But it never felt like, oh, this game sucks. Like, it never reached those levels of frustration or uh, attitude or what's the... I can't remember. Can't think of the term. Um, against the game. Any malicious energy there. It was just, oh, damn, didn't do it. And immediately run it back, whatever it was that did take me down. Something that was a little bit more difficult, I will say, I think was the parrying system. I think the parrying system they added in this game was great. The last game, Shield, didn't feel super important. You kind of relied on the dodge a lot more, whether it's dodge to the side or the dodge roll fully, if I'm being honest. This one with the parrying system, the Shield became more of a thing. And I know the developers have talked about it. They wanted to add that. Mission accomplished here. I think they did it. They obviously have the attacks that you have to with the sh interrupt with the Shield if you want to 
get a tactical advantage or stop a powerful move that your opponent is doing. However, when it comes to certain bosses and their attack patterns, sometimes parrying isn't the best option. And what I mean by that and what can make it difficult is because it's another layer of kind of patterns you have to learn about. And for me, that was frustrating because, okay, here comes an attack with a yellow ring. Yellow ring means, hey, you can parry this. Okay, great. I'm going to time it. I'm going to parry it. What would you think happens during that parry? Opponent will get staggered and you would take advantage, right? Sometimes, for no reason, no explanation or whatever, you would parry said move, but then opponent would still come in with another attack. And this was a hard mental block to kind of get over for myself where I don't know if it was just because of the earlier stages of the game where parry, attack, parry, follow up, parry, punish, whatever it is. That was ingrained in my brain. So when you do it successfully later on and the opponent is still attacking, there's a lot of hits you're just going to eat. You're going to take because for whatever reason, this person isn't thrown off their guard. And it wasn't until the very last two bosses um, that I kind of like finally understood like, okay, I'm going to parry, but I'm still, I need to know here comes a second attack or maybe don't parry this one, parry the next one because that's the end of their attack chain. That at points can be a little bit difficult and frustrating um, com in compared to the first game. Granted, the first game had the same idea where there were like attack strings and attack patterns, just like any game with bosses and whatever it is, where you have to learn the things, learn the sequence, and then you can find those opportunities to attack. But with you not using the shield as much, it was more, okay, dodge one, dodge two, dodge three, I can attack kind of situation. This where they taught your brain, oh yeah, block and defend, when those later stages came, it was kind of just like, nope, can't do that. Nope, can't do that. <laughs> like you had to kind of reteach yourself in a way, or at least of a strategy of what to do in that situation. So at times that felt difficult. I wouldn't say it's a knock against it, but there were definitely a lot more times that I died in this game, I feel personally, f compared to my 2018 playthrough of the original. Story wise, no spoilers still, don't worry. Story-wise, I think it was fantastic. Um, it it never felt like there were portions of like a lull or a long gap. If there were side quests I was doing, granted, I could understand like that portion obviously would feel like a gap of the main storyline, I get that. But everything that was tied to the main story all made sense all the actions the characters are going about made sense and it never felt like a point where a la a spider-man of i think also 2018 maybe it was 26 i don't know whenever spider-man came out from insomniac a mary jane section where it's like i get why this is happening but i'm not having fun even when i was not playing kratos and i was with atreus during his sections it still felt fun and it felt important and it felt relevant to the whole overall story that they were trying to tell when it led to the conclusion which once again still no spoilers the payoff of that story was great seeing the character development um and the character growth from main characters to side characters to whatever it was the payoff there was so worth it and felt emotional in the best ways i can feel it now which is weird thinking about it um very very good in terms of what they what they attempted to tell here and did tell here was amazing and <clears throat> i think just once again what it did better than 2018's version of the side characters just getting hit from more angles other than just a Kratos and Atreus getting hit from what's Sindri going through, what's Brock going through, what's Freya going through, what's Freya going through, what's Tyr going through, what's Thor going through, all these different characters getting hit numerous times and getting conclusions to each and everyone's story 
it felt like it meant something. It wasn't just, hurrah, our main two heroes have their thing, and then, oh yeah, everybody's just kind of along for the ride. Everyone's payoff felt maybe not good, maybe not in a positive ending, but it felt like a conclusion that had weight to it, if that makes sense. So, the last bit of my non-spoiler stuff. Do I recommend playing this game? Absolutely. If you play it on the PlayStation 4 platform, or the PS5 platform, or eventually on PC, if and when they decide to release a port, seems like Sony's been doing that more likely. Absolutely recommend this game. Do you need to play 2018 before you play this game? Absolutely you do. This game is great on its own. Don't get me wrong. The story is good and you will get something out of it. But I think this is a one-two punch. Clearly because it's a sequel. This is absolutely a one-two punch. You need to play both of these games to get the full experience out of. If you want that full character arc, play both of them. Please do yourself that favor. Okay. Now we are going to go into spoiler territory. So if you do not want spoilers for any aspect of God of War, now is your time to leave. I love you. Thank you for checking out this podcast. If you want to check it out, you can check it out live next week and every other week on twitch.tv slash enigma9011. Follow the socials, all that jazz. I'm not going to do the full outro for just you guys. (laughs) Okay, full spoilers. Three, two, one. Holy shit, Superman showed up in this game? No, I'm just kidding. Wow. This game made me emotional. (laughs) So, a lot of people, including myself, with this being Ragnarok, being what we were shown, or seeing what we were shown at the end of 2018's version with Kratos dying and the developers saying that this was not going to be a trilogy, this was going to be the conclusion of this story. I thought Kratos was going to die. And the fact that he did not die and the way that they told the reason he was not going to die was interesting. But also, like... They messed with our brains so much. They knew what they were doing. They knew the groundwork they had laid ahead. Obviously with the teaser of the, you know, the whole mural of him dying. But Kratos, like throughout the journey of Ragnarok, the game itself and the story, the journey they had you, the player, and Kratos take along in the whole thing of acceptance and like seeing Kratos accepting his fate And making sure his son is ready to live beyond and past him being present was just very powerful. And when it came to those final moments leading into going into Ragnarok and going against Asgard and Odin and those guys and leading to those final moments of what Kratos believes to be the end of his life, that those final moments with his son before they head into war, just the vulnerability they showed with Kratos, the times where, multiple times in this game, where they show him almost, if not on the verge of tears, showing emotions that we never thought we would expect from Kratos, once again, from the earlier iterations of these games, just being the rage monster that only yells and Zeus I'm going to kill you and just rage monster everything to see him weak and I guess maybe even times scared just giving making him vulnerable just was such a emotional experience of like Jeez, we are going on a ride with this character and obviously Atreus has his own journeys of like seeing him in 2018 seeing even just even his growth of that game of not being able to hunt at the beginning to handling his own in 2018 and then in this game him being you know still learning being overconfident in his abilities but then dealing with all this grief and guilt when eventually 
Brock dies because of actions that he feels he's caused and his relationship with Sindri just blowing up and becoming nothing because of Sindri's you know disdain for Kratos and Atreus um and obviously his brother's death and him just not caring at all for anything just looking out for revenge for his brother and for himself seeing what Atreus goes through is like just another layer to that cake of just like you're rooting for these characters and hoping everything ends up well for them and uh by the time that the story concludes and it is that more happier note of you know they did succeed they caused Ragnarok they took down the evil forces and then they have this moment of love and respect for each other that they go on their own separate paths but you know they're both going to be okay seeing Atreus at the end walk away to go you know fulfill his what he feels is his duty to the giants and bringing them back it, <laughs> i cried it just it sucked i mean it was good because obviously oh he's grown up you know good for him like all the build that they put into that it just worked magically and it was great um and I appreciate that it works so well because <laughs> even though I got spoiled on an aspect of the story, the moment in itself and the payoff of the whole story in itself still hit. It still resonated. It wasn't, it was about the journey. It wasn't about, well, I guess it was about the destination too, but. The one little thing didn't ruin everything. So the spoiler I'm talking about, and I kind of alluded to it on some stream, <clears throat> is Tyr, who is this whole pivotal figure in the beginning of the game. Because Tyr is the only person who has united the realms and is the god of war for you know the norse mythology and he's supposed to be this driving force that atreus wants to find and help and have assist him into creating this prophecy and making sure it comes true you locate Tyr. he is very against war he is a pacifist now he doesn't want to lead that way he wants to carve his own path all of that i thought was brilliant and you know i thought the character was interesting the spoiler that i got was that Tyr is not actually Tyr. Tyr is a fake. So later on in the story, Atreus works with Odin to learn more about Odin, try and gain his trust to either stop Ragnarok or at least get an advantage. We learn that Odin is trying to seek out like this all knowing power or at least know what is next for gods after they pass on what is their afterlife and he has found this mask that he believes will allow him to peer into i don't know if it's another realm it's some kind of tear in the world that contains this knowledge that he can sense so atreus helps him find the different pieces of the mask and eventually will steal the mask from odin in order to help obviously his father and their allies upon returning to sindri and brock's house with the mask he shares what he knows with his team Tyr says okay i understand we've done everything we can beforehand i understand now is time i will support you in your journey i have a way to at into asgard and everybody's like, what? You're holding this from us. Why were you doing that? Yada, yada, yada. And he's like, I am sorry. I know I've been a burden this whole time, but at least let me help out this way. And he has the mask and he says, okay, just let me gather my things and we'll be ready to go. Brock says, hold on a second. You don't have any things. What are you talking about? Why do you have the mask? That's the kids. He earned it. Give it back to him. He's very judgmental and like come, come, kind of coming down onto Tyr. 
and Tyr stabs him and kills Brock. And turns out that Tyr was Odin. That was the big holy shit moment, right? So unfortunately, got I didn't get who the fake Tyr was spoiled, but I knew at some point the other shoe was going to hit here, right? I think that's the saying. So Odin stabs Brock and Brock dies. This leads to the whole rupture of Sindri's relationship with Kratos and Atreus. He does not forgive them, has no pat, like, just says they keep taking. They take, take, take everything. They endangered his home, killed his brother, just take all these materials from him. And, like, he's not going to help anymore. He doesn't want anything to do with them. Um, and eventually this leads to, you know, Kratos and Atreus getting all the realms together, slowly recruiting these different forces. So like Surtur from Muselheim, you and Atreus, Kratos and Atreus get him. Um, Freya goes, gets the, the maidens, AKA the formal Valkyries. You have the Mimir and Hills. I don't remember his name. Pigman going to the realm of the dead to get them. The elves with Freyr. Eventually Sindri says he'll go get the dwarves. You get to Ragnarok, you see these forces come together. Big epic conclusion. The dwarves do not come. The two of the different realm towers are destroyed in Asgard, so your resources are kind of fucked up. And you eventually, eventually you get to the conclusion. You fight Odin. You win. Huzzah. It wasn't that difficult, but it was a fun fight nonetheless. And the way you, just, you defeat Odin, you defeat him in battle... And Atreus decides to trap his soul into one of the little marbles that Angerboda had given him to kind of like where the, the giants keep their souls, right? And Kratos gives it, gives it to Freya, says, you know, apologizes or not apologizes, but gives her the opportunity to decide the fate. Because obviously Odin is fucked up with Freya way more than those guys. You can decide his fate because we took that choice from you, life or death, last game with the whole Balder situation. She says she can't do it, even though she thought she could when she reached this moment, gives the marble back. In the last moment, Sindri will pop in, snatches the marble, and smashes it, getting his own revenge and revenge for his brother, and then poofs away again. Sindri is absolutely like a shell of what he is. And we see this in our first interaction when we're apologizing or attempting to apologize. Sindri's always been the germaphobe and has always worn gloves and been very, not dainty, that sounds like the wrong word, but very, I don't know, uh, particular with certain things. At this point with him being broken, gloves are off, his arms are exposed, he's not taking care of himself, he's, you know, mourning in his, in his way. But he decides Odin's fate and kills him. Strong finish there. Um, before we get to the post-game stuff, uh, let's talk about other side characters that they have built on. So I kind of alluded to it in the, the non-spoiler section. Brock and Zindri, obviously their journey, learning more and getting more connected with these characters from them just being essentially a shop in the first game. Clearly, they did a great job with them, obviously with Sindri and Brock's conclusion with Brock passing. Um, that story felt powerful. Freya getting her revenge and then Freyr being introduced with his rebellion group, that felt good. Mimir trying to right his wrongs, or at least have us assist him in righting his wrongs, those stories paid off. Um we were introduced into other side characters in this game. Angerboda, I think they did an okay job with. She was interesting. She was a good, you know, not outlet for Atreus, but like a good friend and a good resource for learning the giants and his past there. And with her returning later on, with the help of Fenrir and returning of the wolf that had passed at the beginning of the game uh, into the giant wolf of Helheim, that was good. But a character that I really grew to really enjoy and like was Thrud. And Thrud was um, the daughter of Thor and Lady Sif. And she becomes friends with Atreus, and all she wants in life is to be a Valkyrie. She just wants to go, be a strong warrior. Her mom's not very supportive of it. 
and her dad is unfortunately kind of kind of dismissive he's very he's essentially under odin's thumb and is just his lackey and him and sif are trying to work for the positive they both quit drinking but at one point thor does go back to drinking and is kind of a piece of shit but through just wants what's best for obviously her family and for you know to achieve this dream and seeing her character growth and her realize that odin is a piece of shit and try and stand up for her dad seeing thor get murdered by odin in front of her and then trying to redeem him by fighting odin but unfortunately just getting blasted away it's a heartbreaker and you know that was just a character we had no idea about in the first game at least i don't think so we were never introduced to her she was a character that i really enjoyed her path or seeing her story unfold in this game and you know hope the best for her not that we're ever going to see her again but was a character they did very very well um and so as i alluded to you fight thor before you fight odin shocker great fight there <clears throat> another one that felt epic very similar to the beginning fight not super difficult but the growth of thor in this game too was an interesting one from all of obviously the threat of danger from the beginning of the game to his just outright hate of atreus when you're doing these side-by-side -side missions with him for odin to get the mask pieces how he's just a begrudging you know old man i guess you could say just hating on everything hating on atreus and atreus trying to be like this sympathetic and like resource that thor can not be honest with but kind of break down and realize what he's feeling or whatever be this positive light for him and seeing thor's obviously his fall with going back to the bar trying to redeem himself for his daughter eventually turning against odin but then odin unfortunately killing him another good character arc there um post game stuff so similar to 2018's game there's always the side quest stuff that if you didn't go back to do or you didn't do you could do that now and then there's all the collectibles and quests if you choose to do that you could do that as well and they add a few missions here and there you do get a credit roll at the end of the game uh when atreus and kratos split and they decide to go on their separate journeys you do get the full credits roll after you do one mission similar to 2018's where if you did i think it was everything you would get the tease for ragnarok and thor arriving at their house there was no tease of uh, another thing because this was the conclusion even though i did everything i made sure i checked when everybody's houses <laughs> the conclusion here where you get the full credits is brock's funeral and this was another heartfelt moment where like the funeral itself was good i think the build-up to it was a little kind of lackluster but seeing kratos say his goodbye um and sindri return one more time just to see his brother off for the funeral and then dissipating away it, it just was like man you hate it because sindri was such a a cool character um or a good character like just being supportive and helpful and to see him so destroyed and hurt like knowing they're well knowing they're probably not going to continue this journey unless it's maybe from an atreus perspective in his journey to the giants like that's just where we leave him is destroyed without his brother and it sucks um just another emotional send-off after the conclusion with atreus leaving um as for boss fights um there are hidden bosses that you can kind of wake up around the world with these uh this um heirloom you can wake up trolls you can wake up a dragon that are like little bonus extra resources that you can get but they're not necessary for any trophies or quests or anything like that i did a few of those but the main bads similar to 2018 instead of valkyries that you need to fight in each realm you have berserkers that you need to fight in this game and these berserkers 
most of them have very similar attack patterns, but there's a few things that are different from one to the other, um, whether it's elements, like the elements that they use in their attacks, fire, thunder, uh, bifrost, whatever it may be, uh, or small attack differences. Um, these were a few of the opponents that I talked to and alluded to earlier with like dying a lot <laughs> that kind of happened. And that happened with the Valkyrie too. I get it. They're side bosses and they're supposed to be a little bit more difficult. I will say they are fun. The most annoying one was one berserker that had two allies with them the entire time. And it's three, essentially three opponents you need to defeat. And when you're trying to defeat one and then spells or blasts come from the other ones, oh, it's just a pain in the ass. Um, the final one, similar to the Queen of the Valkyries or whatever the fuck the last Sigrun of the last one was alluded to or her name was, King Berserker took some time. And it's not like it took time because it was difficult. It took time just because, similar to, I guess, a Soulsborne boss, you just chip away at health, slowly but surely. One of the things, you learn the attack patterns, eventually you'll get it. I alluded to the parry system. You can parry the first one, but then they're still going to attack. Um, a lot of the berserkers did that, but it, felt like he had a, it felt like he had a lot more attacks that kind of followed a similar chain, whereas attack pattern, and you need to make sure you parry the correct one or then be prepared to dodge. Um, his final stage, I will say, was probably the most enraging. So Bifrost is by far, by far the worst thing that they added to this game in terms of like a measure you need to deal with. Being on fire, sure. Being frozen from the ice, sure. The Bifrost, such a pain in the ass. You get hit with the Bifrost either by a physical move or whatever. It's on your health bar with the blue. Next attack you get hit with takes all of it away and then a little bit. And if you get covered with the Bifrost and you're not dodging enough or allowing yourself to regain that health enough, you get slapped, you're done. <laughs> and in his final stage, and I didn't realize it until my very last attempt before I beat him, but he shouts in a rage, rah! And if you're in vicinity of that range, it's a Bifrost yell. And I'll just boop, 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 add. And then he emanates Bifrost from him. So most of your attacks, you need to try and stay away and do a ranged approach. Because if you're too attack, too close, excuse me, it's just going to keep attacking your health bar. And then that next attack, regardless of how much health you have, you're going to die. <laughs> so that was a little little tough. But like I said, I, I finally picked up on it in my last attempt. And then the next one was like, okay, I got it. All those bosses were very um rewarding to finish off and beat is just always that uh, sense of accomplishment so those were good and then we did have the one final valkyrie fight of gana she was another tough one which was just once again another pain in the ass of attack patterns it's very similar to the valkyrie fights of the previous game so obviously having the gap of knowledge of since playing 2018 last Learn, relearning all of those and then dealing with the new stuff and making sure okay dodge this one don't parry that one do that do this do that um took some time not impossible but a few attempts here and there um i will say Muselheim's challenges which they had that last game as well these ones are a little bit annoying annoying in order to unlock the last six you had to do they had three different rooms, which you would clear each room with three different challenges. But then for the last six, you did two challenges, so one from each room, in different orders. So room one and two is one combination. One and three is another combination. Two, three, three, two, three, one. So that was a little tedious and annoying just because, like, oh, i got to do it again. i got to do it again. i got to do it again. And you could find the best or slash easiest challenges to do to kind of streamline that process. But that was, I would say, maybe the only negative or annoying thing. Um, as for side quests that didn't, or end game stuff that didn't really matter, the end of the game, Ravens, if you collect all 48, you get rewarded, but then you fight their keeper which is essentially just one of those witch things. You shoot an arrow with it, it stuns it, and you beat that up. wasn't very rewarding. 
One, they have Asgard rifts, so Asgard blows up after Ragnarok, and then certain pieces are strewn about, strewn about the other realms, which is essentially just little encampments of bot or little enemies. You defeat them, just another checklist thing. On Niflheim's, the Asgard prison is there, and that one you can explore a little bit, but in there, you find the real tier. And I feel like that should have been a bigger thing, but it was just like, hey, we're here. We broke you out. Holy shit, you're Tyr. And he's like, hi, I'm Tyr. Uh-oh, Odin's not going to be happy about this. Ragnarok's going to happen. And you're like, oh, well, little do you know, all that shit's taken care of. And he's like, what? Mind blown. I got to go take all this in and think about my life. And that was it. <laughs> it was just like, we, uh, I get why he was there. Do we need to include this? No, we didn't. So that was a little disappointing. Um, you can have closure with the Charlie the Turtle mon or Monster. Mon Ch Dad. The house that Freya lived in. You can say your goodbyes to him. Anger Bodhi, you can talk to her and have a moment with her, which was cool. Same with Throod. Um, you find uh, the Midgard kid. His name is long and starts with an S. I don't remember it. Just... You know, you follow up with each of the, the characters post-game and just a little bit more additive onto their conclusion, but you see them around the, the realms and what they're doing. So that was kind of cool. So, like, seeing through, she, when you find her, she found Mjolnir, Thor's hammer, and she now has it, and she whoosh, launches away. So that was kind of cool. Um, you get a little bit more conclusion and end cap on these characters' stories if you explore and do more of the post-game stuff. Um, but yeah, it was just an amazing game and, you know, had I finished it <laughs> prior to the, the new year, this absolutely, excuse me, by far would have been game of the year. Um, l looked great, played great. And most importantly, the story was great. Um, yeah, this, oof. Yeah, I don't know if it's just me lately being, you know, a big sad boy, but the emotions hit with this one. And I think that's that speaks volumes because, you know, if a story can take you in that much and, oh crap, what's the, what's the term? Engage you enough with that, um with it and what it's trying to tell you and it allows you to have an emotional response to it it's doing something right so yeah just an amazing experience overall um as of right now they have said this is it like i said i know atreus is going to as far as god of war lore going off to try and save the giants or do that if they decide to do that in a game great um i i don't know if i'm like yearning for it because this felt like a nice wrapping of a bow on everything even if they do allude to in the end kratos being kind of looked at back in this god uh stature or form through phase prophecy I wouldn't say no, but if this is truly the end, then this was a, a really good conclusion, and it felt like a conclusion. Um, so yeah, God of War Ragnarok. Amazing experience, had a blast with it. I'm sorry I did not continue it on stream and share that with the audience. Maybe one day we'll do a replay through of both 2018 and Ragnarok, and I can kind of share through that together. Um, but yeah, if you guys played it yourselves, let me know what you thought. Comment section, messages, all that fun stuff. Um, love to talk more about this game and see what people's thoughts and feelings are. Looking forward to finally listening to some spoiler casts like PS Trophy Rooms with Kyle and Joe and see what their thoughts on it were. And uh, yeah, just uh, looking forward to more experiences like that overall. 
Well, everybody, this has been another episode of the Wait, What Are We Talking About podcast. My name is Brett, a.k.a. Enigma9011, and you can catch this podcast live over on twitch.tv slash Enigma9011 every Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern. You can join the chat over there like Papa Griff, Supermander, and the Lady in Wonderland did today. We'd love to have you in on the conversation, but if you can't catch it live, that's A-OK. Go over to YouTube and podcast services the very next week where it's broken out topic by topic and put as one big video in MP3 for your amusement on the following Friday. Last but not least, any way you can support the show by sharing with a friend, leaving a five-star review, whatever you can do to help out the channel, help out the show, would mean a lot. It may seem small, but it does help us out in big ways, so... Um, we appreciate you for it. Hope you guys enjoyed the episode today. It was a long one. Don't expect four topics next week. <laughs> but I'm glad to be back. I'm glad to have a more positive outlook on things. Hopefully bringing a positive energy uh, to myself and to you guys as well. Thank you guys so much for watching, giving us a listen, and we will see you guys on the next one. Take care.